Welcome colleagues, we have an exciting discussion um, this evening and um, we're going to focus on the attainment awarding gap, educational marginality and black mental health and we have an exciting panel of expert um, speakers and contributors um, to, to take part in this discussion. I'm Jonathan Glazard and I'm Professor of Inclusive Education at Leeds Beckett University and I'm going to be co-chairing this session um, this evening with my colleague Christine Callender. Um, Christine, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Christine Callender. I'm an Associate Professor at the UCL um, in London um, and I, as Jonathan has indicated, I'll be co-chairing him this evening. And um, shall we go through and introduce um, the rest of the panel? So, Kelly, do you want to start? Hello, my name's Kelly Dooley and I am a head teacher in the in London. I'm the head teacher of the Richmond upon Thames School, secondary free school that opened in 2017. Uh, and uh, really pleased to be involved uh, and contributing to the panel uh, this evening. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Olivia? Yes, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Olivia Bassi. I am the head of quality and compliance at uh, NCC Education. NCC is a global uh, awarding organization. Um, and yes, uh, just to echo what Kelly has said, I'm really pleased and uh, thrilled to be part of this panel and at uh, a subject that I'm really passionate about. So yes, looking forward to some lively discussions. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Jason? Hi, good evening everyone. I hope you're keeping well. Um, my name is Jason Arde. I'm an Associate Professor in Sociology at Durham University and I uh, feel really fortunate to be on this panel. I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say and engaging in this way, so thank you. Thank you, Jason. And we have another um, panellist, um, Richard Race, who will, I think he's teaching, so he will be joining us later. Um, in the session. So the way that we're going to run this session is we have um, a series of questions that we're going to basically put to the panellists and, and we're going to invite them to give their views on each of the questions. Um, so Christine, do you want to start with the first question? Okay, but before I do, um, we have got a chat function, so if you want to put um, questions in there or make comments, please do, and Jonathan and I will do our best to keep a track of those and to interweave those into the conversation this evening. Well, I'll kick off with the first question, and this is a question for you, Jason. What do you see as the main challenges in tackling the degree awarding gap? Can you share with us any examples of best practice from your own context or context that you're familiar with? That's great. Thank you so much, um, Christine. Oops. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate your question. Um, I guess in terms of the, the issue at hand, um, one of the things that's really difficult is that I guess currently the awarding gap stands at 23%, um, according to kind of advanced HE figures in 2019. And they're kind of different variables in terms of institutions who've managed to, I guess, close the chasm on that gap namely um, Kingston being one of them and University of Leicester, who've both worked within, kind of got that down to 13%. I think in terms of best practice, the things that I have engaged with in terms of working with other institutions and that I've seen that have worked, it's not as simplistic as just having more black um, and Asian and minority ethnic staff. But what I do think has been useful is having a diversification of um, academics, to um, change context. I think having more um, interaction with uh, students of colour in terms of curriculum design has been a really useful outlet. I think reassessing the modes of assessment we use and how they may be um, how they may be exclusive in terms of actually ensuring that those modes of assessment are reaching wider conglomerates of students, I think has been a really important thing. And I think finally, having um, institutional buy-in, I think has been really important. So um, heads of departments and mem members of departments actively taking a hand in thinking about how they can, you know, de-center whiteness as a structure from that curriculum and kind of acknowledge that it is actually a factor in those students um, you know, being disadvantaged or there being an attainment gap. So I think that's, those are the things that I would say I've observed and I've been involved with that have worked. Um, there are many other interventions, but I guess those would be the ones that I would say have been the most uh, pertinent and most useful. 
Thank you, Jason. Can I just have a follow-up question? Because I'm quite interested in, in Kelly's thoughts on this um, and how this kind of might connect with similar discussions in schools around the attainment gap with different groups of pupils. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the key challenges uh, around that, I think we have to kind of first consider um, why the gaps may ex exist. And um, kind of in my experience, um, that often sits around low aspiration uh, sometimes and maybe potentially um, sort of gender and, and kind of racial stereotyping around um, uh, what's possible. And then possibly leading to kind of like limited role models can also have a, 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 a negative impact on the attainment gap. However, I think at the same time, there are also plenty of opportunities um, uh, to, to, to balance that out. So thinking really about the positions that we're in. So if you're working within a school, um, or you're working with a college context, educational context, and we're all leaders in our own right. So there are plenty of opportunities for us to uh, represent and support and be visible for these young people and also be an advocate for the system, for the processes and structures to enable um, that gap to reduce. So ask, asking the right questions or asking the difficult questions. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly important looking at the data um, and asking why those um, gaps exist. I think the conversation has to always be there around that, particularly in schools, because otherwise that gap is going to widen and widen. And, you know, whatever sphere of power or influence that you have, you have to be asking those questions in order to make sure that those students potentially who aren't visible become visible. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Jonathan. Okay, so this is um, a big question, um, which I'm going to ask um, everybody to contribute to this question. Um, so in your view, how is the attainment or degree uh, sorry, how is the attainment or degree awarding gap um, impacting on progression to A level um, and undergraduate study and even postgraduate study? So how do you think the gap actually impacts on progression at different levels of education? Um, and what can we do about that? So um, can I start with Kelly? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, as, a, as a, uh, a professional educational professional working in secondary education, I think that, that closing that gap is critical um, because if the gap exists at level two at GCSE, then those opportunities at A-level reduce. Um, so so when, those, when, when, when it happens there, uh, the challenges uh, become even broader because the, the, the opportunity to get to A-level is reduced. Um, thinking about that then and moving on from A-level progression, moving on uh, from A-level to potentially university, I think one of the key challenges, and again, we have to kind of think about how young people progress to university in the first place. So who has the power to make those decisions around predicted grades, for example, and the challenges that exist for particular groups around getting those um, those the, the correct predicted grades that are even going to give them access to particular universities. So from a school perspective, very, very early on, those gaps need to narrow. We need to look at the curriculum. We need to look at making sure that those young people have those opportunities because the gap starts way before uh, you know, we even get to A-level and, you know, if the gap's already there, the opportunities for young people to progress to a wide range of, we're not saying that they're only, uh, only the Russell Group universities exist, but we're talking about how them having um, the opportunity to access a range of uh, courses and programmes. Um, so, you know, for me, even before the, we get to A-level, there's a, there's a piece of work to do in schools, and it goes back to what I was saying before, about us having our eye on those those young people, them being visible, us asking the right questions and trying to challenge um, all of the reasons why those particular groups persistently and consistently underperform. Thanks, Kelly. I think I think also just to just to respond to that um, is I guess the reasons why we have that gap in the first place are complex and multifaceted. So um, I guess some of it is to do with expectations and, and challenge and teachers' expectations of, of different groups of students. Some of it might be to do with the curriculum. So and, and the curriculum design, as as Jason mentioned about the importance of the curriculum. So I think finding the reason so so if the reasons are complicated we're not going to find 
I guess, a single solution to address those issues. So, um, but finding those those barriers, I think, is important, isn't it? Uh, uh, absolutely. I think, you know, we have to kind of go and look at this a structural kind of review of what is happening in your school and why those particular young people um, aren't addressing uh, or, or aren't meeting the expectations of the curriculum or is even the curriculum uh, not not even challenging enough or not interesting enough. So it's it's for me, it's an institutional wide approach. Um, and it's it's about understanding what those young people need in order for them to progress. Is it is it is it mentors? Is it is it greater or increased representation of people potentially that look like them, or is it a different narrative? The way that the curriculum is delivered or the the, the hook points. Um, so you know we recognise there are, it, it's complex. There are a number of factors, but those factors need to be identified, and there has to be a will uh, within the institutions and in in on a wider level to address those challenges uh, to move the agenda forward so that the gap does close um, and those young people can uh, make the progress that, that they're capable of and that they deserve. Okay, Olivia, um, what's your response to the question? Thanks for bringing in me, uh, Christine. I think uh, just to echo what uh, both uh, Kelly and J Jason have, 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 uh, have uh, raised regarding the, the, the gaps in attainment. I think from uh, having taught in schools myself and moved to my, my current role, and I'm still involved very much with um, schools across the Greater Manchester area. So I do volunteer to work as an enterprise advisor and I work with uh, a number of heads of schools to, to try and raise aspirations of young people. I think there's a, uh, perhaps a, a threefold disconnect in terms of uh, what uh, sort of knowledge or uh, sort of uh, children, uh, young people are very, um, there's a lack of knowledge across, particularly from the experience I've seen, perhaps uh, in our community and, and I think that is something that may be a little bit controversial. I think we need to address it as well, that uh, the, 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 the black community particularly, when I do meet parents, uh, they are interested in what the school is doing, but we also have to take that responsibility and, and, and that accountability to be interested to see uh, how we can progress uh, our, our, the ch our children and how we can make sure that they understand that uh, the next stage, if it's university, what are you doing about it? What subjects are you interested in? And then we can also engage with schools. And, and I mean, I, I'll just give you an example. I, I was uh, uh, working with one, one school in Greater Manchester and uh, um, one of the parents came to me to say that, uh, and, and I accept these challenges from both sides, that the barriers are, are, are across. So, so yes, there's a systemic issue, but I feel perhaps uh, as well as parents, we have to take the responsibility. And this parent came to me, uh, to, and and told me about uh, they brought a guide to to the to the um, sort of uh, enterprise day and they were discussing this with the teacher to say well I think my, my child needs to go to this university and the teacher was very surprised and um, it, and obviously this shows that perhaps uh, as our community we need to address that these are knowledge gap and we need to be prepared to challenge the teachers who are there because unfortunately a number of the teachers are. Disproportional, disproportionate from uh, the black minority. So there's less teachers from our side who will um, perhaps work with our children and raise those aspirations. So we also need to take that accountability as parents, go into schools, discuss with your child, what is it you want to do? What university do you want to do? What subjects do you want to do? Go in with a guide and tell the teacher, this is what I want my child to aspire to. And yes, the teacher might be surprised because they might be surprised that you do know your staff, which is great. But I feel as parents, we need to take that. We need to go in there and tell the teachers what we want so that we can perhaps reduce that attainment and take that ownership on our side and, and, and progress our, 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 our children the way we want them to progress rather than perhaps wait for a system that I feel is not going to change anytime soon, unfortunately. So I feel we need to take that accountability as parents and go in and challenge the teachers and, and try and perhaps understand where the knowledge gaps are. And that will come in from speaking to our children so that we can understand what's going on in school. If there's an enterprise day, why are you not involved as a parent? I see very little black parents in some of these enterprise days. So I, I feel perhaps we also need to take some responsibility and accountability towards where we want our children to go. So that's... Uh, some of the areas I feel I need to just strongly put in 
the attainment gap. Thank you, Olivia. Um, sorry, my internet cuts out for a second there. Um, Jason, uh, did you get the chance to respond to this question? Hi, Jonathan. Um, no, I was going to say, um, and welcome, Richard, as well. So we can see. Um, in terms of, I, I think um, Kelly and Olivia have, have covered it masterfully. Like, um, I think one of the main things is, you know, to kind of um, complement the points that they've made is, I think that there's a there's a throwing off the scent that happens um, between kind of secondary school um further education and higher education and i say that because it's all it's kind of around aspiration i've been very fortunate that i was a secondary school teacher and i taught in fe and i've taught in he and one of the things that i always kind of become really cognizant of is how teachers engage with young people from a very young age and the types of aspirations and the types of dialogue that they engage in them with and i use the term throwing off the scent because when i was a school teacher very often you would have students of color particularly young black boys who may say I want to be an astrophysicist, which was which is a true story. Someone actually said I want to be one. One of the teachers had said to them, I think that's a really good idea, but realistically, that's a difficult thing to do. So I think that from what I've heard, you're really good at sport. So maybe it might be worth like kind of continuing with that. And it's subtle, but it's a reoccurring message if you hear that from year seven to year eleven. And then you get into kind of year twelve and year thirteen. And if you've stayed in the same school and you've gone to that sixth form, you're almost typecast and typeset in this way and that in itself can be quite limiting in terms of attainment because your focus would completely deviate from the 11 year old potential astrophysicist to okay I'm going to be an elite athlete and it's not to say that elite athletes can't not be academic but it's to say that there's a pigeonholing that that kind of encases the black narrative where you they're often pigeonholed from a very young age and so that aspiration isn't nurtured in the same way and I think that really adds to the deficit not to mention that there are approaches and conscious biases and and you know um, upheld stereotypes that teachers have of young black um, people and the limitate and they place a lot of limitations on their academic ability um, and in most cases are facilitated to make a justification for that limitation which isn't helpful um, so I totally agree with everything that um, Olivia and Kelly have said in that kind of raising and kind of rethinking about how you kind of systemically break that down. But I think I think it's possible because I'm an idealist and I think anything's possible. But in, you know, uh, I think the most important thing really is um, you know, seeing people like Kelly in a position they're in. It shouldn't it shouldn't be a novelty it shouldn't be a rarity it, and sadly it is like i mean i could count probably on one hand how many black head teachers i know and if i tried hard enough i could probably i wouldn't have to try hard to find out how how many other black head teachers there are but they're not a lot um and that shouldn't be the case but that visual example is such a powerful thing for students imagine being a black student and seeing a black female head teacher like that those those kind of things change lives and i i was brought up in south london and i did my schooling was in south london and from being a kid in school to completing my my um my higher education qualifications i was never taught by one person of color so that is and that's saying something coming from london so it is really really impactful in terms of of having that kind of dialogue and having that visual representation so I think that's all I've got to say on that, but it is really important. And that adds to, because you have someone like Kelly or Olivia fundamentally saying, hang about here, you can do this, because they'll ask questions like, Kelly, how did you get to where you got to? Olivia, how did you? And those questions kind of ensue. It's like a natural process of kind of cognition. Hang about, there's someone that looks like me that's in that position. How did they do it? And that's how, in my opinion, you can build aspiration and attainment. But to do that, it's something we all have to buy into. We can't lean on Olivia or Kelly to be doing this work themselves, you know. Thanks, Jason. I think you've, you've raised a few interesting points there. So so one point I think is the importance of, of having um, high aspirations and, and challenge for all young people um, that's really really important but also bringing bringing people of color into schools and colleges who, who have achieved you know and, and done really really well and actually they can be good, really good role models um, for young people so I think that's important I think also leaders of 
leaders of schools and, and colleges and universities need to be asking those questions about, you know, do I have a diverse staff, actually? Um, what's the diversity within my staff? And actually, are um, is diversity represented on the leadership team within my school or college or university? So, you know, so are people of colour being given opportunities to, to get promotion, etc., and to get onto leadership teams? I think uh, these are critical questions I think leaders need to be asking, really. Um, thank you. Richard, can, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, again, apologies to colleagues and participants for being late. I was teaching until five o'clock. I have um, moved from one space to this one. Um, my name is Dr. Richard Race. I'm senior lecturer in education uh, at uh, Northampton University. Hello, Jason. Um, you're missed, um, my friend. Um, and visiting professor in pedagogy at Sapienza University. Um, in Rome, in Italy. Um, my interests are in multiculturalism and education. I'm an advocate of multicultural education and anti-racist educational methods. Uh, in that sense, um, again, thank you to Christine for um, devising the questions for this evening. And, and I'm going to stop there uh, because there are several of us and I will come back in at the appropriate points. So, uh, that space, Jonathan, or do you want me to talk now? Yeah, so, so Richard, sorry, the question was, how is the attainment gap um, or degree awarding gap impacting on progression to A-level undergraduate study or postgraduate study? Ooh, um, attainment gaps, I think, uh, if you talk about attainment and performance, um, in my eyes, you're talking about what's actually taught in the classroom or in college or in university. So we're talking about curriculum and we're talking about curriculum that appeals to everybody. If we're, talking, we're looking at cultural diversity, we're looking at um, relevant contemporary um, examples that are applicable to everybody. We're not just talking about a white history singular. Interestingly, we're not talking about a black history singular either, because again, it took a black female postgraduate student to actually get me thinking about the term black. If we look at BAME, if we look at the A in BAME, uh, we, we, we're looking at Asian. Asia is the biggest continent on the planet. Where do you start? So in that sense, again, I think we need spaces to allow both teachers to train, diversity training, uh, but also within a wider continuing professional development to actually teach more professional practitioners, and we've got to find the time, which I think is the biggest issue. But again, I think we need, we need a change in mindsets because again, the attainment, if you take five steps back, for me, it's about what is taught and how it's taught. And in that sense, if we look at the profession in England, the teaching profession, we're talking about a majority of white female professionals. And it's also about white and black males, of course, but it's getting people trained to teach diversity, to teach difference, not be afraid of doing it. And again, I think that then leads to greater attainment for everybody. It's, 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 it's a very, well, of course it's complicated, but for me, it's about many things. And if we're talking about attainment and awarding gaps, which is in the title of, of tonight's session, um, I think we've got to go back and we've got to look at curriculum. We've got to look at this, the systemic issues that prevents. I mean, again, it's there. Cultural diversity is there in programs of study across three core and seven foundation subjects. Um, but it, for me, the issue at this moment in time, and I'll come back to this in, in comments later on, is how do we get teachers to teach materials that will appeal to everyone, not just a white majority, but the whole range, a whole culturally diverse range. Uh, and I think that's important. And then of course that leads from curriculum to teaching and testing and, and the opportunities that are actually there for people. Um, you know, if we're talking about inclusion, you know, the system is, is loaded for some people rather than for others. And in that sense, again, I mean, that's debatable of course, but I think that there is an element of truth in that. How do we change the system? How do we change not only 
what we teach, but how we teach it, and then how will that shape perhaps a new system of qualifications? And it's happened interestingly during COVID. There are suggestions that GCSE and A level will change in in how that it's going to be examined in the future. I mean, that's that's you know that's still an ongoing debate. And it'll be interesting to hear what our colleagues in schools think about that. But for me, it goes back. It's about how you change what's being taught, how it's taught, what is taught. And again, that, in my sense, challenges it. It fundamentally challenges the system that we have at the moment in the sense that if we're going to be more inclusive, if we're talking about gaps and we're talking about attainment and awards at all levels, you know, all the way through to college and university, then how are we going to change our system? to make it more inclusive and, and prevent issues of marginalization and, and also improve ultimately everybody's student health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, Christine, do you want to come in with the next question? Yes, um, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm going to come back to you actually, because um, um, you asked about, um, sorry, you commented about um, curriculum and Obviously, we need people to deliver that curriculum. So my question to you is, um, I'll ask this, and if you can kind of make it as succinct as you can before we jump into the next question. If you had one piece of advice to give to a colleague, um, and, and the, the advice was to support them in eliminating um, an awarding gap or an attainment gap, what would that be? That's, that's a, a very interesting question. I will keep it short. Um, I think if you're going to change, if you're going to encourage change, you've got to provide the support mechanisms to instigate the change. And as I've argued in my research, one way of doing that is through diversity training within wider continuing professional development. So to get people to change how they think, how they practice, um, it's got to come through CPD. And for me, that that's that's one way of doing it. I think there are others. Again, that it's it's you've got to change, you've got to change the systemic issues. Um, you've got to change institutions. I mean, again, advocates of multicultural education are talking about fundamental reform of the system. James Banks in America. That's that's where the origins of multicultural education comes from. So, in that sense, I'm not looking for a revolution, but we're looking for the reforms. Um, that perhaps counter the reforms we had 30 years ago in 1988 with the introduction of a national curriculum with the problems being national, singular, nation, and again, the consequences that has for curriculum. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Richard. I'll hand back over to Jonathan for the next question now. Okay, so again, a broad question. Um, how does educational marginality manifest and what can we do to prevent it? Okay, so I'm going to put that to Kelly. Um, so how does it manifest? Well, I think if we think about um, some, of the, uh, some of the things that we've talked about here um, and how young people become marginalized, there are a number of external factors that often contribute to that. And I think we've said it already in this group here, when those, when the right questions aren't being asked and when we have low aspirations for particular groups of individuals, when where there isn't a sense that those particular groups belong or they matter, this is just left to happen. So you have young people being persistently, consistently being um, um, uh, receiving fixed term exclusion after fixed term exclusion and we don't have a, a kind of holistic approach or, or, uh, across the school where they're coming together and saying hold on a minute sorry so, excuse me um look at the data let's look at the data and say well hold on a minute all of these fixed term exclusions are coming uh, are, are predominantly coming from one group so there's not a will to kind of understand um, uh, why these things are happening um, but I think then we have to put all of that together and say well this is why it's this is this is a potential what the data is telling us How, what can we do as a group to move forward because the negative impact 
of a young person, we've seen all the statistics around what happens to a young person if they eventually become permanently excluded. Um, and that's not what, what we want. And I think that term permanent exclusion is, is kind of a fundamental factor in that what we term marginality, because once you are excluded from the education system or the mainstream education system, the chances of you uh, going back into that and um, you know having some positive life outcomes reduce, and more so if you are also a part of the system because you are looked after the child or, or, or you have other factors that, that contribute to, 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 to you becoming marginalised. There's also uh, thinking about some of the some of the some of the um, socioeconomic status that impacts this. So often, if you look at the statistics, we've got young people who are um, who are in receipt of free school meals and who are in for, who who are eligible for people premium grants. We've got this particular group or, or their special educational needs who are because of a number of factors. Uh, marginalised from education, which then leads to marginalised from um, society. So we have, I think we've come up with a number of areas in here in, in the meeting that we've had today. For me, it's always about we've got to sit up and take notice. There has to be a will to recognise what's going on or look at the data and say, OK, let, let's look across our, 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 our institution. Uh, let's have those conversations. Let's create those safe spaces for those conversations, for colleagues to engage in uh, training, as, as, as Richard said, to move this forward um, and make a change. But there has to be the fundamental will within the organisation to recognise what's going on. Um, and, you know, I think we are, all six of us are in this room, in, uh, we, we, are, we have significant spheres of influence. I think anyone watching or listening to us this evening, um, everyone can make a, make a difference, everyone can influence from whichever position you're in, whether you're a classroom teacher, teaching assistant, whether you're a professor, head teacher, dean, you can all make a difference from where you are. Um, and I think that's really important that we sit up and take notice to what's going on, check the data uh, and, and insist that a change has to, has to happen. Kelly, that's so important because because the the point about actually this is a this is everybody's re responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of one person. It's not just the responsibility um, of people of colour. It's not just you know everybody needs to actually be be driving this forward. It's the same with with LGBT. So th this is an area that I'm 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 really passionate about and 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 try to drive forward within schools. Often it it becomes the LGBT teacher who's actually driving this forward and, and they get given the role to lead and, um, and you know, develop provision for LGBT students. But actually this, I think it's really important that, that every teacher and every member of staff within the school or college or university take this seriously. And it's not just one person's job. And I think, Jason, you, you made that point earlier about this is everybody's responsibility. Okay. Um, Olivia, do you want to respond to that question then? So how does educational marginality manifest and what can we do to prevent it? Yes, thanks, Jonathan. I think uh, just to chip into what Kelly has said, um, I think uh, what we perhaps have to acknowledge is there's structural inequalities in the wider society. And, and I think perhaps that's where we, we need to start with and look at those structural inequalities. Uh, having worked in schools, um, a number of young people are still on um, uh, free school meals. Uh, and and uh, it's very evident that there's financial strains across uh, uh, many schools and, uh, and, and, and parents are, are having a significant strain with, uh, with a number of areas to meet uh, student uh, out their, their, their children's demands. So I think if we acknowledge that there's a financial strain, what can we do about it? And I, and I like the idea that it is everybody's problems. It's not just a singular, uh, perhaps, um, area where we can point into the school to say the school needs to do something. We need to do something. We need to look at it and, uh, and accept and acknowledge, yes, there's financial, uh, there's structural inequalities across the society, which means that 
students are perhaps even going to university. So these issues are pre-university. So how are we expecting our students to be able to, to go into university and successfully uh, complete their education? Well, they've come from perhaps coming from a free school, uh, having had free school meals, and perhaps maybe they've got uh, a scholarship or a bursary, and they still need, need that financial support. That financial uh, capacity and capital is very, very important uh, for us to, to, to see how we can support these students. And and perhaps we, we need to look at ways of, of, of addressing how we can um, work with schools to make sure that the students we've identified, and I think Kelly has brought in a fact about data. I think data is key here. I feel having worked as an enterprise advisor now with various schools across Manchester, um, that there's a lack of perhaps um, um, a central repository of best practice of these students that are low attainment, how we, what are we doing about that across uh, perhaps uh, like Greater Manchester? They, they, there is no central repository for, for, for best practice and how to share that across so that we can help each other and help other, other schools uh, work on this attainment and this marginality that we are picking up. So I think it's very, very important that we know and, and, and acknowledge first structural inequalities, to look at the data and three, continue working with each other and perhaps work with various schools and share that data. Heads of schools need to be speaking to each other. They need to be working with their careers uh, advisors. They need to be working with those students who are lawyer team and those students who are on free school meals. And they need to see that they are, they are monitoring those students and monitoring that data. And, and I've, I've, I've worked with one of two schools and I've seen some best practice examples of, of students starting from 14 years old up to university stage and they still have that one link where they can they can be able to come back to that one central person who can be able to to to, to, to follow them up and and perhaps engage with them in a way that is is trying to help them understand uh, and and be able to to master how to be even more successful at, at university and be able to 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 continue uh their their, their their successful education journey so i feel that to me is one area that perhaps other other panelists might be able to to offer some key practical examples that they've had experience with. So that is for me that is where I would start with. Thank you, Olivia. I think the the, the point you make about actually having a central repository um, and sharing best practice is really really important. Um, you know, I think I think there's such a lot of good practice going on, but we don't know yeah. about it. Um, and I think sharing that practice is is critical, really. And I, I think personally, I think teacher training needs to do more. Um, you know, I think some some trainees may get may get this covered as part of their teacher training curriculum. Some trainees may get nothing um, in their teacher training curriculum. I think that's not acceptable. We need to be addressing this thoroughly and deeply within within teacher education programs. Um, I, I, I did a search in the national curriculum um, last year for, for race and race equality and nothing nothing was in there at all and, and it just absolutely alarmed me that the national curriculum actually you know yeah. doesn't it doesn't address it at all does it um, yeah there are massive gaps massive gaps across many um uh, and, and I think I can see what the government is doing and and they've got these benchmarks they've set for school but they're almost futile because they're not feeding into the data that's there and schools are not talking to each other they're not identifying these students and they're not supporting them so we are left with students who are let down from uh, uh, inequality issues and th that will carry on up to the university stage so it, it, it's it, it's almost a, 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 an issue that will continuously happen and and it's going to be very difficult to 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 manage it unless we look at the data, we work on a central repository and we all share that best practice and then we're able to identify how we can uh, perhaps support the students. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Christine, do you want to come in the next one? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I just want to respond to the um, ITT issue um, because I have spent many years as a teacher educator. I'm not so hands on these days. And um, we seem to have, you know, this, these conversations seem to go in waves. Um, there was a point where you know, there was very explicit conversations about racial inequality, um, education experiences of different ethnic groups, focusing on, you know, closing those attainment gaps. But, you know, about 10 years ago, when we ended up with a coalition government, all of that went. Um, um, and then notionally, um, 
people argue it exists because there is the Equalities Act and you have to make sure that we're in compliance with that. But, you know, when you're working on, you know, your, or you're the program leader for an, a teacher education program and you've got the ITT curriculum that you have to deliver, um, I think it, you would have to be incredibly um, skilled in working out how you map this conversation across your provision. Because for me, that's the best way that it works. Um, I think what tends to happen at the moment is that students probably get half a day or a few hours session where they where they look at these issues. Um, and, you know, institutions themselves aren't necessarily required to monitor them anyway. Um, I'm always talking to my colleagues um, in my institution and in other institutions about the importance um, of doing that. And it is an ongoing kind of piece of work um, that um, I've, I've been involved in. But to jump into the next question, I mean, we've talked a lot about um, how, you know, some students become marginalised um, because of, you know, sometimes, you know, factors that are external and, and sometimes, you know, I, I kind of think, well, what are the internal things? So to follow up the previous question, um, what, I, what I'd like to ask you is, what is it do you think that universities or schools can do to help students feel more included, to have a better sense of belonging? Um, and how can we support that student experience more than we currently do? Because we do have a lot of children who are sitting on the margins. Um, I'll ask that question of Jason to start with. OK, thank you so much, uh, Christine. Much appreciated. Um, I guess for me, um, the most important thing is really to engage students in learning through talk, um, through discussions. I think that is a pretty simple mechanism in the first instance because they remain on the margins because no one actually ever asks students of colour what they are thinking and what they think about the curriculum. Um, it's a very kind of didactic curriculum that's a one glove fits all model that is very much saturated or centered within the Eurocentric discourse. So I think making people part of that process becomes really, really important in the first instance. I think in terms of establishing belonging, there are small wins and those small wins are the types of things we have in our curriculum as we've already discussed. It's about talking about current affairs, but in a different way. It's about not um, streamlining or reducing black excellence to just musicians and sport. It's about moving beyond that and drawing from different examples. There's a kind of lazy pedagogy that ensues where, you know, a lot of teachers when they're in the classroom space and, you know, in the academic space, generally speaking, you know, they often go to the flavor of the month, you know, so at, at the moment, obviously what Marcus Rashford sounds amazing, but, you know, I, I would bet a high ransom that the amount of reference, the amount of teachers referencing Marcus Rashford as an amazing example of what you know young black boys could follow, it you know there are, there are other people like yeah, and again it goes back to that idea of you know streamlining black excellence to just sport or to just music, and I think in terms of that sense of belonging, it the onus is really on teachers and schools as a community to develop what that means in alignment with a multicultural and multi-ethnic society. And I think all too often that charge is left to black um, educators, academics, practitioners to develop that for the school. And it should be really a communal endeavor that involves everybody conceptualizing that. So often you'll have schools that have strap lines of, you know, we have over hundred languages spoken at our school, which is great. That's, that's fantastic. But actually, what does that look like in reality? Like, um, do those people who can speak those 100 languages, do they look at that kind of sense of belonging and think, actually, I'm reflected in what I'm seeing? And it, it, it is small things. And I, I would go as far as to say something as simple as a school menu. Um, and, I, and I don't, you know, yes, I buy into healthy eating and all that. But, you know, is this idea that, you know, particular cultures, um, you know certain foods from particular cultures on health unhealthy and it's all of those little things but they become these kind of tropes that pe that they grow you know they gather moss and they kind of grow and then you go into society and if the whole point of schools prepare people to go into society 
you're going in with these kind of racialized stereotypes of what people could be. So I think there's a lot of mechanisms that we could use to establish belonging. But fundamentally, it's about having hearts and minds and values that are of the same essence. And if you have that, you do have a chance of instilling that. But to do that, you know, students, learners in that process must be equal change agents. So it can't be hierarchical. It has to be distributed in many respects. And to do that, there's a humility that's required to do that, which in education, generally speaking, is quite absent because we operate within a hierarchical model. Thank you, Jason. Um, Kelly, do you have any comments from a school perspective on that question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I just want to um, just uh, I think a, a lot of what Jason has said, um, absolutely. I think it very much um, fits into uh, a, a school context. For me, uh, when I when I when when I think about why I came into education, um, perhaps 20 years ago, I didn't know it was I, I didn't have the phrase, but the phrase for me is social justice and it's about eradicating social injustice. And, um, you know, the majority of the colleagues I've worked in in schools fundamentally buy into that and they believe in that. The work that we've been doing at my school um, around uh, how do we move the curriculum forward, how do we develop that sense of belonging, has um, thrown up a number of really interesting areas uh, and particularly around creating safe spaces for uh, black uh, black and minority ethnic um, staff and Asian staff and uh, non non and, and white staff to have conversations about race to be part of the conversation that we're having to be able to ask the uncomfortable questions uh, to be in a place where they feel that they may well want to make a contribution but actually they just don't feel safe to ask the question or to be involved so what we what, what I think it's really important is that you we take notice, we recognise these young people, these you know everything what's going on in in our schools and society. But I think fundamentally, we live a you know we live in a this you know this we we live in a global society. You know every young person at some point in my who leaves my school, and my aspiration is that when they leave my school, I work in Richmond and the, and the children in this borough year on year for the last five years I believe um, have achieved at key stage two the highest results in the country okay so we have got we, we are here at this school you know in a very privileged position that the number of students that will come through this school will uh, will pr pr predominantly go on to a level go on to university and go into seats of power what we're trying to do and what I think is really important is that whatever we do in our curriculum, in our structures, in our leadership here um, is that we're preparing these young people to to when they have to make that decision about whether they're going to employ that person or whether they're going to give that person uh, uh, the A-level uh, uh, predictions that they need. They will remember their experience at school. And just in, in terms of what Jason was saying, he th those children have seen people in different roles they have worked with a black head teacher and, and and a black deputy head and um they have worked thank you they have worked with a whole range of people and experiences they've had a very rich uh, educational experience that helps them to understand the complex and a beautiful world that we live in so we can create that sense of belonging but i do think that we need to work with our staff as, as richard was saying and create those safe spaces for us to have a, a conversation engage and and move that forward and of course involving the young people in court of course involving the parents um but i think just to pick up on some of the uh, some of one a point that was made about um, um george floyd and um uh, the, the the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, movement. I think one of the things that have um, have been really helpful, and I think anyone listening that really needs to to, to 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 should consider, is there's a real opportunity here. There's a real opportunity to build on um, all of what we've seen to have those conversations because those a lot of the uncomfortableness has already been played out in the media. It's been out there. Everyone's talking. So we can now have those conversations 
in our schools, in our universities, in our colleges. Um, but there is a there is a wraparound support. So if we were ever afraid to talk about it, um, I think now's your time. <laughs> now's the time to put to put it on the table um, because there's a safe cushion, a safe space. And, and it's now time for you to kind of grow that in your institutions and take the opportunity. But absolutely, we can make all young people for you feel included. My school, as I said, is majority um, non uh, uh, non students of colour. The majority of the students that are at my school are, are white, um, but they are having an experience that is very different. And they'll go out into the world and they'll see people that look like me and recognise and see us, see black people. Uh, that they can be professionals, that they can be leaders, that they can. So, so there is hope, I think, um, and, and we've just got to jump on the on on uh, on this bandwagon and and try and make things happen. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now for the next question. Thank you, Christine. Um, Kelly, I loved, I loved. The, I'm writing down really interesting phrases from this. This discussion tonight so Jason I loved your phrase lazy pedagogy um, I think I'd, I'd like to look into that in a bit more detail um, but Kelly I loved I love the fact that you said that these students then take you know they progress through school and then they take seats of power um, which is fantastic and, and that got me thinking about the need to you know if we want if we want these students to go and be leaders in the future and we, we want students of colour to be leaders in the future, we have to build leadership into the curriculum. We we have to work in partnership with students and we have to get them to become leaders within, within schools. So um, actually, what are we doing within schools to, to give them those leadership skills to drive forward this, this work um, and to become leaders of social justice and equality within, within schools? And I think, you know, these, these issues really matter to young people. We've seen how young people they're really concerned about these issues they're really concerned about things like climate change environmental sustainability you know they have the potential to lead on these issues and and we need to be i think harnessing that within within schools okay so um yeah so the next question um, then is about the pandemic so the pandemic um, has exposed health and other inequalities um, and there's some concern about student mental health what are the implications of disproportionality of health outcomes on the mental health of BAME students? Okay, so I'm going to go to Jason for that. Hi, Jonathan, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, this is an area that's really close to my heart um, because I spent three years basically researching this area uh, with NHS London. And I was really fortunate. My mum's a mental health nurse and so is my younger brother. And in that time, I trained to become a qualified counsellor so I could better understand these issues and in particular engage with young black people who've experienced um, altered mental state. And I would say the kind of most significant things are we don't have um, a mental health system or we don't have mental health care professionals that are culturally sensitive and culturally cognizant of the um, implications of racism and the psychological impact of that and how that might impact upon aspects of educational experiences, personal experiences, um, professional experiences. And I guess in the research that I've been fortunate to undertake, one of the things that becomes really prevalent for both students and staff, academic and professional, is this experience of, is this idea of actually um, the kind of therapies that are used. So for example, um, what we do know is that in terms of cognitive or behavioral therapies, very often many uh, black and ethnic minority people as a first point of intervention are referred to medication. So sertraline or any other of the family of antidepressants, um, rather than going through a process of um, kind of psychological intervention and finding out why some of these problems ensue. And then the second part of that actually is to kind of neutralize race and racism and suggest that actually it's not that, it might be a different issue. Um, and it really undermines the potency of racism as this really penetrative object that can really, you know, disrupt mental well-being, 
um, and physical well-being. And I suppose a part of it that becomes really, really important is how we as a society um, look at uh, black people in terms of dealing with mental health. So I think there's always this kind of veneer of they're resilient, they get on with it, you know, and that's, you know, from white people and then from black people also, you know, um, you, you learn to deal with it, you learn to deal with disappointment, you learn to, you have to be strong, you have to kind of show front. And I think because of that, um, it's very difficult not to mention that very often most black people's experiences of mental illness or um, being made, you know, having, having an altered mental state, it's often weaponized against them. Um, and we know that through, you know, um, David Hare did a fantastic piece on me and my mental health a few, two years ago, I think, for BBC, and spoke about how um, he had been treated as a black actor um, and how he'd been kind of tranquilized with, and they explained that, you know, the tranquilization that they used was enough to stun a horse, which is like, which is crazy when you think about that. And for many black people, their first engagement with mental health intervention is normally through the judiciary or the criminal system. So um, all of those kind of relationships and the fact that we don't have a model of psychological intervention that takes into consideration those kind of wounds inflicted by racism is problematic. And it's about thinking about how we train our healthcare professionals, particularly in education, where we know that black and minority ethnic people have differential outcomes. And that's not to underestimate the impact of that across the intersection. Um, it's just to suggest that because we have a hierarchy of intersectionality, race has always been placed at the bottom of that intersectionality, whereas it should, it should, they, they are all, they're all equally important. And, and that's, I think, one thing that we really need to think about, particularly, you know, in the composition of our healthcare professionals within the sector and outside of higher education, in primary education, secondary education, further education as well. Thank you, Jason. Um, Olivia, do you want to respond to this question? You muted, Olivia. Oh, thanks for that. Um, thanks for bringing me in. Um, I think just to echo back uh, what uh, Jason has touched upon, and, and I think uh, I recently uh, worked on an article to to to, to share with, uh, with some of my connections uh, across in LinkedIn, and it was about uh, mental uh, mental challenge because I, I feel that uh, we are now at a, a a poignant point where after the George Floyd and the Black Lives Movement, these are these almost. Uh, uh, a moment uh, where we have to grasp this moment and talk about these issues because uh, it's something that uh, is affecting particularly um, the, the, the black community. And I think uh, from just a little bit of research that I did, obviously I didn't go into the full research uh, as, as uh, Jason did, but I'm just looking at what's, what's available there. I think what I immediately picked up on is um, there's not enough resources for uh, mental health issues. It's a big problem, it's a big challenge, and I feel it's something that um, is a wider issue and we need to look at it and, and, and address it. And if I go back to perhaps where we are, how we're going to support our students, I feel like perhaps um, universities should encourage uh, their students to be radical, use their voice, um, get petitions, go into lobby Downing Street, uh, speak to ministers and find out how we can get some resource to help us because this is an issue. It's an issue that, and that's why the Black Lives Matter movement is, is very strong. It's a poignant point. It's a very political movement that we need to grasp this moment and use it as, as perhaps a way to lobby for more resources for, for the mental health issues that we are, it's impacting on our society. And, and, and perhaps even reflecting from my own personal experience, I do have a number of girls I mentor and they really, uh, been had various challenges when it comes to their mental capacity, and 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 I think even my close friends that the, the George Black, uh, the George Floyd, uh, it moment and the Black Lives moment, it's it's something that I feel we we, we need to to be lobbying the government ministers to, to to perhaps invest more resources in this area to support us to support students who are who, who want to carry on with with their studies to be able to to find ways that are, are practical so. I think an example as well, I saw uh, one of the students I was working with told me that 
the drop-in sessions uh, at universities are very limited slots. There's lack of access or support. Um, and some some of the students as well work on social hours. So yes, it's 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 a very uh, there's various things to look at. But, but perhaps for me, I feel that there's something here. We we need to use this moment to, to to have our students use their voice and lobby for change. Change for uh, a specific mental health uh, uh, sort of um, area that can work with within our community and that can the government can support that needs to come within our community because I think this in itself, if we are not operating within uh, our own self, if we, are, if we are not well within ourselves, we can't operate and we can't reciprocate the, the, the benefits, the social benefits into the society. So this is, to me, it's, it's, it's a pandemic in itself. It's something that I feel really that the government and, and all government ministers need to, to be taking this as, as, as a way to look at what uh, health resources are there for our community and perhaps even the wider community when it comes to, to mental health issue. Um, just to be a bit controversial and to go back to um, some of the points that were made uh, in terms of what universities can do, um, I feel perhaps when I look at uh, what universities have in place and in terms of uh, looking at outcomes for uh, managing um, sort of race issues and race discussions. I do know that uh, a number of universities are signed up to the uh, race equality charter. So I just wanted to ask the audience now on the panelists, uh, uh, Jason, uh, Jonathan and Richard, you're both coming from a university background. Have the university signed up or invested into the race equality charter? Because I feel the race equality charter will be able to address some of these issues and, and there's a clear outcome of why that charter is there. So I'd like to pose that to, to the panelists now. So I think I think that's a very good question, Olivia. Um, but I think it's it's not just a matter of signing up to the charter. It's a matter of because people can sign up to the charter and then that can that, that can be underpinned by limited action. So they actually need to do something um, and not just tick boxes, basically. So I think I think it's really really important that that they don't just sign up to the charter and then and then just deal with it in a superficial way. It needs to be it needs to be dealt with. Um, I think using a whole institutional approach, um, you know, we need to deconstruct the curriculum, interrogate the curriculum, but we also need to look at the leadership and the management and um, we need to work with in partnership with students. Um, it's It needs to be dealt with on a very deep level and I think um, you can sign up to um, charters and you can deal with things on a superficial level just to actually get the charter, but actually I think it has to be dealt with on a deep level. I agree. I agree. I, perhaps what I meant to uh, emphasize is uh, is because um, I, I feel there's certain criteria that as a university you will have to meet and there will be uh, some accountability if you don't meet that criteria and Office for Students will hold you accountable. So that responsibility is almost mandated on you as a university to meet those outcomes. So I feel that's why I feel is something that perhaps could be a way to to try and uh, get the right support and work within senior leaderships because obviously they have to buy into that charter and they have to make sure rather than it being a tick box, it's definitely implemented correctly and the outcomes are, 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 are sort of followed up and there's a specific data that universities can come in and, and perhaps when they're held accountable to it and within uh, perhaps 12 months, there's a clear track of what a university is doing in terms of race issues and and, and, and certain uh, diversity topics that we feel, I feel need to be discussed by universities. I agree completely and I think every university, every university and college needs to sign up to it. I think it, you know, it shouldn't really be an option. I think everybody should have to do it. Yeah, Richard, some, some level of accountability. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Richard, do you want to offer a, a response here? Yes, thank you, Jonathan, and I'll come back with Olivia. I agree with you, Jonathan. I think you're right there. I think all universities need to sign up. But with any policy, it's how it's implemented. Uh, and in that sense, I'm going to try and address Jason's notion of lazy pedagogy because it was mentioned in the text before. And I'll probably get closer to the question that Christine asked me before. I'll have another go, Christine. Um, I'm just going to give three references. Uh, Jason's mentioned the BBC. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through these. First one is uh, Newsround. John Craven's Newsround, anybody? 
Are, are we that old like I am to remember that? But there's uh, something that was broadcast last month on what is Black History Month. And it's a great teaching resource because it has the voices of young black youth. So in that sense, I think that's, that's a really interesting teaching resource. Some of you may have watched Enslaved on BBC Two on Sunday with Samuel J. Jackson being a co-presenter of that programme. I think that's another phenomenal resource that we can use at all levels in education. And finally, um, on Monday evening after Newsnight on BBC Two, Being Blacker was broadcast again. And that's something that I would recommend to all participants and colleagues. Again, there, there's acknowledgement there of uh, Black Adred, a.k.a. Stephen Burnett Martin, uh, and the documentary that was initially broadcast in 2018 about um, Black Adred. Uh, and again, just, just I mean, it's one of the best documentaries I've seen, probably the best documentary I've seen in the last five years, because it highlights what it means to be black um, in not only 2018, when it was initially broadcast, but also back in the 1960s. And one issue that I want to raise, again, as a teaching resource colleagues, is that in the documentary, um, one, of, one of Stephen's children, one of Black Adred's children, is back in the Caribbean being educated. And the reason why that's the case is because he was being racially profiled, stereotyped, and he was being, if we're talking about attainment and awards, he was being classified as being problematic, meaning um, he was, you know, behavior management issues um, and he wasn't succeeding and he was being failed by the system. So what Black Adred and his partner do is that they take the child to the Caribbean, I think it's Jamaica, and they put him into a Jamaican school and he succeeds. He's in the top quartile in the school. Now, for me, that's a phenomenal teaching resource because what does that highlight, colleagues, participants? It highlights an opportunity to show what's actually going on. If we're talking about black mental health, again, those examples, JJ's example, is one that needs to be taught. And again, going back to the other two resources, I'm using all three of them this week in my teaching and practice because again of course um you know they, they give my culturally diverse classes an opportunity to breathe think and reflect on these issues thank you thank you richard um right back to christine sorry um so i'm going to lead in with the next question um, and it kind of builds on what we've um, been talking about. We've, we've talked about some of the problematic issues around mental health, and I'm, I'm thinking this question is more like solutions focused. So how might schools and or universities respond to some of those mental health um, issues that um, BME students present? Um, and if you had kind of advice for schools or institutions, what might that be? So can I start off with you again, Jason, and then I'll come to... Kelly. That's great. Thank you, um, Christine, and thanks to everyone as well. This is um, having a blast. Um, in terms of um, interventions, or I, I guess the one that I think is most important, is providing appropriate CPD. So I think um, and that what that CPD would involve as part of uh, mental health care professionals training is becoming racially and culturally literate and cognizant and actually competent um, and very often. And I always try to give people the benefit of doubt. I think it's through no fault of their own. I think the mechanisms for which we use for, tr for training mental health professionals, particularly in, in the Western, in the Western, in the kind of Northern hemisphere, in, in, in itself it is quite, uh, restricted to Eurocentric forms of um, psychological intervention. So I think there needs to be um, training around um, what it may mean to encounter or to to engage with someone that's experienced racism and that as a physical and a mental trauma and how that actually can impact aspects of thinking, you know, um, I guess, engagement with society, 
engagement with people and having that understanding because I think the gaslighting that ensues when people talk about racism in what is perceived to be a safe space in a mental health space and then the gaslighting that ensues is normally like well are you sure it's racism uh, you know it may, maybe you're being hypersensitive to that and I think being um, professionally literate in that regard is really really important and I think universities actively and educational establishments primary and secondary and further need to actively sort to employ or enlist uh, people that have that kind of professional competency. And ideally, you would have a really diverse range in terms of the composition of mental health professionals. Um, but I think the most important thing is to have people that have that understanding. And that, abs that understanding is absent at the moment. It couldn't be any more absent. But in an ideal world, you would also have a diversification of healthcare professionals and I think that's really important because I think that vis that visceral visceral that visceral visual example it's so so important you know if you go into that kind of environment you are engaging in it in a vulnerable way and to engage in that vulnerable way to actually see someone that looks like you um is quite a powerful thing and I think that universities that that's not a quick win that's more of an investment um, and that actually might mean universities growing their own talent in terms of um, psychology students who may want to go into that line of work. It may mean actively going to particular agencies and looking for, you know, black trained mental health professionals. And there has to be a commitment by educational institutions to do that. Thank you, Jason. Um, I've just had an alert that we're kind of running out of time. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to have to kind of draw um, the threads of tonight's discussion together um, and I'm going to hand that responsibility over to Jonathan. Thank you Christine. Um, so we've had a really really rich discussion um, and I think I think the key thing for me is that this is a this is a really really complex issue and therefore um, there's going to be no magic bullet, no single solution um, to address the issues and and you know we need we need a, a multiplicity of solutions to address these issues. So um, I think the point that Jason made about being professionally literate is really, really important. And also Jason's point about um, making sure that all professionals, um, including mental health professionals, um, are culturally sensitive. So that's about training, isn't it, to make sure that, that they understand um, full of the issues and, and have that cultural sensitivity um, for staff working at all levels. So I think that's a really, really important point. Um, we've talked about the importance of diversifying the curriculum um, and making sure that we don't just provide students with a white curriculum. We've talked about the importance of having um, a diverse body of staff um, and, and role models that students can look up to and having um, leaders, diverse leaders um, in place. And we've talked about the importance then of, I think of leaders actually interrogating their staffing and actually reflecting on whether they, they have a diverse body of staff and whether whether people of colour are being able to, to access promotions. Um, so that's important. So opportunities to, to ensure that people of colour can access leadership positions. Um, we've talked about the importance of providing safe spaces um, for students to, um, for all students to discuss these issues. And I think we've 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 talked about the, the the fact that now is the time to actually address these issues. You know, we now is now is the opportunity to actually really grab hold of these issues and talk about them um, properly. We've talked about the the race equality charter um, and the importance of institutions um, signing up to this. And I think for me, I think prejudice and discrimination and harassment, so racial prejudice, discrimination and harassment um, inevitably create stressors. But I think it's also important to remember that um, I always go back to Mayer's work on minority stress. So, so Mayer talks about um, the fact that people may anticipate, so people in minority groups may anticipate that they're going to experience um, discrimination, harassment and prejudice and 
and they may not experience it, but, but the constant anticipation that they will encounter prejudice, that they will encounter discrimination, and living with that constant anticipation um, actually creates internal psychological distress. And I think I think it's important to recognise that that students of colour may be living with that all the time. They may be living with that constant anticipation that they will they will walk in the corridor, they will walk into the street, they'll go on a bus or a train, and they may experience discrimination and prejudice and, and harassment because of their minority identity. And I think I think that anticipation and the fact that they may be living with that all the time is is really important for educators to know, to be aware of that. I think it's important. Um, so I think they're the key points. Have I missed anything, Christy? Um, no, I don't think so. I think you've um, wrapped them up um, fairly well. And I think I think we also talked about students being leaders. So actually, how can we empower students to lead on um, on this really? And you know, we we want students of colour to go out into society and to be leaders in the future and to take those seats of those seats of power, um, as as Kelly said, um, and. In order to do, in order to to enable them to take those seats of power, we need to be building those leadership skills into the curriculum. Um, I think that's important. And we also talked about teacher training as well, the importance of making sure that this isn't just addressed as a one-hour lecture within teacher education courses. You know, it actually it's about embedding this deeply within teacher training courses and making sure that it's not just a standalone, but it's also embedded through the through the teacher education curriculum as well in different subjects. Um, and the same in school as well. I don't think this should be delivered as a standalone assembly in school. I think it should be permeated through sub all subjects within school. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is unfortunately the end of our session. Um, we hope that you found it um, useful and inspiring and are able to take some nuggets away with you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.